So Ajahn Kovilo and I are going to do a tag team today, back and forth. And what we wanted to talk about for the new year is a list of qualities the Buddha described as the dawnings of the Dhamma. And <clears throat> it's a list that appears in the 45th chapter of the Connected Discourses, the Samyutta Nikaya. And the Buddha says, just as dawn is the precursor of the rising sun, so these qualities precede the arising of the Noble Eightfold Path in a practitioner. And what are these qualities? Kalyanamitta, spiritual friendship, accomplishment in morality, sila, sila sampada. Matt's taking notes. <laughs> accomplishment, accomplishment in uh, chanda, or zeal. Accomplishment in atta, atta sampada, so accomplishment in self or knowledge of self. That one can be a little confusing without context. Accomplishment in view, ditti sampada. Accomplishment in uh, heedfulness, apamada sampada. And finally, yoniso manasikara, which some of you will recognize from last week's talk, appropriate attention. Did I get them all? I got them all. We are practicing this morning. So the we're going to switch those a little bit just for the sake of this talk and end with Kalyanamitta, spiritual friendship, and begin with Yoni Somanisikara, appropriate attention. This is a really meaningful list because these are all qualities which are accessible to us easily. They precede the arising of the Noble Eightfold Path. They're things we can turn towards as the year begins. And they give light to life in a way that is simple, practicable, which we can look at. It's not speaking about a refined state of jhana or a formless attainment. It's just friendship, spiritual friendship. It's just appropriate attention, turning our gaze where it matters. It's just turning our attention towards purifying our ethical conduct. These are the ground from which our practice grows. And so to look to these qualities in the new year, how do we structure our lives to hold the practice and to orient our compass going forward? How do we understand that one more year has passed and like the Buddha said, this human life is a drop of dew on a blade of grass. And how do we take what little time we have left with these precious teachings, with these precious people, and remember and put them to good use? This is the moment to structure. And we can look to more than a good diet. There's, or a new gym membership, we can look towards complete liberation of the heart. The first of these qualities, yoni so manasikara, which we'll speak of, Ajahn Kovilo talked about last week. Often translated as appropriate attention, it stems from the word yoni, or the womb, the source. It's attention that goes to the source. And while it can be looked at in terms of, or is resonant with the idea of turning uh, back to the center of attention. It's very commonly used in the suttas and practice as a term for how we steer our gaze. What do we take in? Where do our eyes look? This is the most simple and yet perhaps the most significant thing we do on the path is where do we turn our gaze? I think it was Hegel who said that evil lies in the gaze that sees evil all around it. And so good lies in the gaze that sees good all around it. And those of you who watched our interview last week with Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo of Cave in the Snow, who meditated for 12 years in the cave, 
might have noticed the moment where Ajin Kovilo and I asked how she got by alone in a cave for so long and came out so so normal, or at least not, you know, her social skills just seemed far better than ours. And she said, I wasn't alone in that cave. It was filled with all sentient beings, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So what can turn an empty cave into an assembly of care and intelligence? So to begin with is how do we steer our gaze in very practical means? This is the moment to make the list of what you're going to do this next year to hold yourself through the times when the seeds are very rough. So practical means, have you set up a shrine in your house? Do you have something, an image of the Buddha or of another icon which means your potential to you? Um, available to bow to first thing in the morning, last thing at night? Do you have a mala, a prayer bead that you can keep in your pocket and recite whenever you're speaking with someone you know you might have difficult with or with difficulty with or during a brief break at work? Are you meditating at least 20 minutes a day in the morning? In the morning, you can add on more later, but get 20 minutes in the morning, that's basic hygiene, so that you actually have the centeredness to steer your attention through the day. If you don't have that, the mind is a raw wound, and there's no ability to steer the gaze. You will be pulled this way and that. So 20 minutes every day in the morning, at least six days a week, can you determine that much for the year, and more if possible? And more, can, you, can we understand that having come into contact with these teachings, we've encountered something unbelievably precious, and we have a duty now to uphold and represent and honor it by honoring these teachings. And that entails holding the quality of our hearts with utmost importance. So can this be the day, the week, the month when you unsubscribe from some of the political podcasts and subscribe to some Dharma talk ones? You can still touch into some long form political articles to stay up to date or talk to friends, but to really take stock of what it means to be informed versus taking care of one's heart. You know, can we be informed enough to make a difference without constantly imbibing news? And really making much of this, where do we steer our gaze and what are the practical means we can take to, to do that? Uh, finding accountability um, buddies who can hold us to this, having a confession partner, taking one day a week to hold eight precepts, perhaps, and dedicate to practice. How can we build a life that honors the growing light which we might suddenly begin seeing manifest? Ajahn. And from that dawning of the Dhamma of Yoniso Manasikara, come to the second dawn of the Dhamma, which is Sila Sampada. Sampada means accomplishment or uh, even perfection uh, or success in sila. And what is sila? It's usually translated as morality or precepts. Um, in a Buddhist context, you talk about sometimes the five precepts, the five silas, that's refraining from killing, refraining from stealing, refraining from sexual misconduct, from lying, and from using intoxicants. And that, as Ajahn Nisbo said, is, is basic hygiene. Um, and we can train at that if we're not yet uh, reached some level of success, if this is not what they call pakati sila, if this is just not our, our normal level of, of sila, if it's just not natural to us yet. It can be. If it seems troublesome now, it's just because we haven't been, been practicing it. A uh, really beautiful phrase which is just said among friends in Thai forest monasteries. I don't think it comes anywhere in the canon, but nothing is hard and nothing is easy. It's only because you haven't done it that it's hard, and it's only because you have that it's easy. So take sila in that way. Whatever um, practice or morality that you're thinking about taking on or uh, things that you're thinking about giving up, 
Yeah, if it's hard now, it won't be if you just keep doing it. Another meaning of sila, which is really helpful, is just habit, is habit. And this is a really over, an overarching narrative of Buddhist practice. You can think of Buddhist practice as wholesome habit formation, where basically uh, taking on good habits of mind and giving up bad habits of mind and uh, whatever that means. Um, and as we stay on this path, we get smarter and smarter, more sensitive to the implications of that and the subtleties of how we cause harm for ourselves and others. I highly recommend if you're taking notes or if you can memorize it, uh, look at the Ambalatika Rahulo Vada Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya, the Middle East Length Discourses, number 61, 61, MN, 61, MN, 61. <laughs> so that's uh, the Buddha's discourse to his son, Rahula. And it's basically perfect instructions on how to uh, cultivate good habits. The Buddha says, uh, when you've done something and you look back on it and say, did, you question yourself, did this thing that I did with body, speech, or mind, did it lead to affliction of self, to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome bodily, verbal, or mental action with painful consequences, painful results? And if you see, yeah, it is. It sucked for me and it sucked for everybody else. Then you should vow and try not to do that in the future. Just basically smart habit formation. When you're doing something, if you look and see what I'm doing right now with body, speech, and mind, is it causing self-affliction, affliction to others, affliction to both? Is it an unwholesome verbal, bodily, mental action with painful consequences, painful results? And if you see it is, then just, okay, I can just stop talking, even mid-sentence, okay. Don't need to go forward. And when you're thinking about the next year, the next day, what you're about to say in the next conversation, just reflect what I'm about to say. Is this going to lead to self-affliction, affliction of others, affliction of both? Is it a painful, bodily, verbal, mental action with painful consequences, painful results? Again, the Buddha, this is the Buddha doing this over and over and over again. Um, but it's helpful because we don't learn the lessons. But if we see that what I'm about to say, it's not going to... Um, yeah, it's not going to lead to self-affliction, etc. Then do it. And the Buddha says, be happy and rejoice and train day and night in wholesome qualities. So that's how we become sila sampada, just become accomplished in, in virtue and in good habits. And the sila sampada, just taking stock of what in your life and work is making you feel weak, what makes you feel like that clean cloth is is ripped and that's one of the words the buddha used to phrases to describe clean sila is untorn and if there's that sense of a rusty nail tearing through cloth we all know that feeling and to take stock and to steer our lives by those moments when they are clear when our heads are above water and make determinations from that moment and that might not be between Christmas and New Year's when you've been with family a lot, but maybe it is. Maybe you've seen something that needed to be seen. But steer from those moments. And if there's an addiction involved, you know, just know that there's these groups, Refuge Recovery, uh, Hungry Ghost United, where you really can tap in. Our addictions are variegated. And finding support in this community and elsewhere to confront those now. Um, Often in Buddhist circles, people take three-month determinations and see if this is a moment when you can do that. I'm, you know, I'm done with drinking. Three months, I'm going to try it. And the monks will support you in this. We're, we're good at not drinking, so <laughs> it's true. The next quality is um, chanda sampada, accomplishment in zeal, enthusiasm. So some of you will know that in Buddhism, there's two words for desire, or what we might loosely translate as desire in English. One is tanha, which is thirst. It's the cause of dukkha, unnecessary suffering, craving. And it's always unwholesome. It's the feeding off the world. And then we have another word, which is chanda, and chanda is often translated as zeal. 
And although in some poly compounds it does speak to an unwholesome desire for, say, sense objects, it's often used to talk about one's zeal and enthusiasm on the path. And someone recently asked, as a Buddhist, I understand now I need to give up these desires, and I just love so many things. Do I have to just stop loving things? And the answer is no. The, we don't become dry automatons when we give up tanha, thirst. Look at the Dalai Lama. Look at these bright people we've seen that have developed this path. The difference, the movement in practice is not towards a lack of engagement with the world. It's towards, it's from an ethic of feeding off of the world to one of blessing the world. And Chanda has this feel to it of uh, making things whole. It's a, it has to do with producing goodness, with aligning yourself with what you feel is your dharmic duty. And we have a deep desire to connect with the world around us. It's not really an option just to cut off. So the practice, very concretely, is to stop those activities which are characterized by feeding. Stop the addictions. Stop the dependencies. Stop clinging wherever you're able. And to move and very consciously replace those with acts of giving. Because if you just try to cut them off, it's, it's, it's brutal. And you, there's a coldness and a violence sometimes, sometimes there. Sometimes it's completely right just to cut. But often to pay attention to how do we replace those connections with the world. So really encouraging people to begin inviting people over to your house for dinner, cook for people, bring food to your neighbors. There's a practice called the Sarania practice where one determines not to eat before having given. Best done perhaps for lunchtime or dinner in the US, although if you do some 6 a.m. deliveries of cookies to neighbors, that's not a terrible thing either. But can you determine to give every day something? Can you replace the uh, Netflix in the evening with a walk with the neighbor or uh, the weekly outing to something that's not necessary with working at a soup kitchen, can we understand that we have a duty now in the world, in a world that is suffering and very broken? And if we channel our hearts to bless that world. There's enormous strength there. C.S. Lewis said, if you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. If you search for comfort, you will find neither truth nor comfort, but only soft soap and wishful thinking in the beginning, and in the end, despair. Nice, C.S. Lewis, that's great. Um, the next quality is Atta Sampada. And uh, before going into this one, it's good to issue a Theravada trigger warning. Uh, this is accomplishment in self. And it might be the case that the record's been running smoothly up until now, and then accomplishment of self? The arm just swings off the record and what? Isn't Buddhism all about not self? What is? What could this possibly mean? Um, but it's there. What is this accomplishment of self? Uh, there are a number of different interpretations. Um, one of them is accomplishment in a view of self. So that's just uh, not investing in some idea that there's any single, inherent, always lasting, always going to be present, uh, manifesting, capital S, self, underlying everything, uh, which is just Buddhist, uh, Buddhist right view. But another way to interpret it, which really does find uh, credence in the canon, is just a level of, uh, yeah, a healthy ego function, a healthy ego function, 
Uh, it's not all about and can't just be all about uh, letting go of self, letting go of, of uh, every kind of self um, in every way. Um, you have to be really careful when you do this. This can easily lead to spiritual bypassing. Uh, this is a modern term, but I feel like this, what the Buddha is doing here by saying, actually there is a dawning of the Dhamma. There's a, a precursor to light arising, which is having a level of healthy sense of self, a healthy, healthy sense of self. This is um, integrating the different parts of your life. And this isn't saying that everybody should go out and have two and a half kids and buy like a, a picket fence or, you know, it's not success on the level of the American dream or success on, I mean, basically any other um, publicly, uh, yeah, you really need to look at who you're taking your, your models of, your models from, your models of life. And, um, but there are these different dimensions of our lives. How do we relate to our family members? How do we relate to our vocation? How do we relate to our, our friends? And if you just, which can often happen, you learn, and you come to a Buddhist class, read a Buddhist book, and it says, oh, there's no self. And you just think, oh, I just need to do that, whatever that means. And I can just uh, coast, you know, through Tinibana without really, um, yeah, giving attention to how you're relating to your friends and family and your vocation, etc. So, just opening the door to that—that that there is a, a place in Buddhist practice for, uh, yeah, just healthy integration of ego function and doing that in a way which is uh, in line with the Dhamma. Um, so making sure you have good friends, good role models, uh, you're reading good books for uh, what that actually means in each of these realms, and looking inward and seeing what leads to, to brightness. So. The next is Accomplishment in View, Ditti Sampada. And some of you will know in Buddhism, there are two classes of right view. There's conventional and ultimate. And conventional has to do a great deal with the reality of cause and effect in our lives, our duties, the conventional world we live in, and honoring our obligations. It's often phrased in the suttas as there is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed, meaning there are the results of good and bad actions. There is mother and father. There are contemplatives and Brahmins who, practicing rightly, faring rightly, have realized this world and uh, the next, Nibbana. And there is uh, this world and the next and spontaneously reborn beings. So the things to perhaps draw out there are the, the sense of duty, that raising up of mother and father, the relationship we have to our family and to our parents in particular, the results of good and bad actions, us taking every action we have and holding it with utmost care and intention as a vital part of the path. I remember a movie I saw a time ago where, before I was a monk, where there was some samurai, before I was a monk, and uh, they, the disciple challenges his teacher, or his, the teacher challenges the disciple and says, you know, would you like to have a practice battle? And the disciple says, I'm saving my energy for, you know, the important work. And the teacher says, there is no important or unimportant work. Everything is equally important. And because intention is key in a Buddhist context, then when we look at our lives, no matter how mundane, with their picket fences and their two and a half kids, etc., it's not mundane. It's transcendent because it's a chance to cultivate the path in every moment, in every intention. Can we fold the laundry that's just been dried and, and put it on the shelf? Can we go to the family gathering and not engage in the conversation or the argument we've gone into again and again. Can we honor our parents? 
if there's a break in that relationship, can we be the first to apologize and to bow? Can we understand the gratitude that we owe this all we've been given and that there's this duty? And a famous teacher named Buddha Dasa, Venerable Buddha Dasa, said, Dhamma is duty. And that's such a useful metric, not only our duty to the outside world, but to our practice. And often I find the best way to intuit that is when you veer from that path, there's a real sense of slight nausea, of waveriness, of justification, of wasting one's time. So can we bring our lives in alignment with duty? The other level of right view is the Four Noble Truths. And most of you will know each of those is accom accompanied by a task, and that's worth emphasizing here, is one is instructed by the Buddha to comprehend dukkha, suffering, to let go of its cause, tanha, craving, the second, to realize peace, cessation of dukkha, the third noble truth, and to develop the path, the Noble Eightfold Path, the fourth. And it's really worth pointing our attention time and again to the first. Because we have no trouble looking and reveling in our moments of peace and when the path is going well. But the Buddha put the first noble truth of dukkha at the forefront, I think in part because it's the part we always want to skip over. We don't want to see our suffering. We don't want to turn towards it. And sometimes, though, this is where real humility rests. It's easy when things are easy. But dukkha, and when the world does not behave as we wish it would, is the only place truly where, or it is the key place where the qualities of breadth of heart, of true empathy and compassion, of humility can be developed. So how deeply can you bow to that ethic of the first noble truth in terms of comprehending suffering and looking at each ornery boss, each difficulty, each moment that's not going the way you wish it would as a gift because it is truly exactly that friction that causes us to give up that tight and constrained and constricted sense of self and break the heart open. And sometimes really leaning into that. And a good mantra is, humble me, humble me. Only through confronting in those moments of struggle and dukkha what we want and the fact that the world is not like we want it to be do we have a chance to open with complete surrender to what is and find the hidden majesty of heart that lies just beyond that dark valley? And there's no limit that I've seen to how beautiful that alchemical transformation can be if you really turn towards your difficulty as a gift. Richard Rohr said that up until about 30 years old, you need some success to build a sense of self-esteem but after 30, everything he's learned has been from failure. And every day he prays that, the, that God will humble him at least once, embarrass him at least once. Can you make that a prayer? And a good mantra really is, humble me. And if you don't know the eight training, trainings of the mind in the Tibetan tradition, I would look them up. Um, and just to hold up one as a teaser, Whenever I interact with anyone, may I see myself as the lowest of all, and from the very depths of my heart, hold others as supreme. So can we lay our hands carefully on that first noble truth and trust that it will transmute into its own light? Home stretch, home stretch. This is number six. The sixth, dawning of the Dhamma, of seven. So just one more after this. This one is Appamada Sampada. Accomplishment 
in heedfulness, the Buddha said that heedfulness uh, was the overarching umbrella, wholesome dhamma, the wholesome quality that all other wholesome dhammas can fit underneath, just as the huge foot of an elephant, every other forest creature's footprint can fit inside of that, that footprint. So, apamada, heedfulness, vigilance, uh, this encompasses all other wholesome qualities of mind that we want to uh, develop in ourselves. And just to point out two ways that we need to be vigilant. One is in line with what Ajahn Nisibo raised as the conventional right view that yeah, the Buddha talks about samsara and yeah, you know, you can't be heedless in a, in a world where uh, our continued um, pleasure and well-being is not assured. You gotta be on top of your game. You can't, um, yeah, just, uh, you have to watch yourself. Um, Nibbana as a future uh, goal is to be inclined towards. So be heedful, be heedful on the level of samsara, but also please be heedful on the level of the present moment. Be heedful on the level of the present moment. What do you have to do right now? It's just be here, awake, let go of bias, leaning towards uh, liking too much or disliking and aversion. And that's being heedful in the present moment. And we need to do both. Uh, see a long view and the exact spot beneath our feet. So heedfulness. Truly home stretch number seven, which we're both doing. So uh, Kali and Amitta, spiritual friendship. And most of you will know this term, but it's such an important one to come back to, to understand that at that moment of dawn, there comes a point where the stars have faded the constellations by which we used to navigate, but the sun has not yet become visible. And it can be disorienting. And similarly, we begin to practice, and there's a moment where we've seen through some of the, what the world had given us, but things have not become clear yet, and we have our storms and our doubts. And just to know that in those moments, this is when community holds each other, and what a precious thing to be sitting here in the midst of a gym slash on Zoom, in the midst of people who, you know, the people here generally will not talk behind your back. They will not lie to you. They, uh, coming into contact with a group of people who will sit in quiet in a room dedicated to what you're, you care about is such a precious thing. And just to value that, to be a good friend to yourself and understand you're doing just fine. That's another good mantra. You're doing just fine. Life is really hard. Practice is really hard. 80%, um, 70% of the practice, Longpur Cha said, is knowing you should give something up and not being able to. You're doing fine. And just rejoice in that. Often people will miss the light nimitta, the sign of light in meditation, because they're expecting a single bright ball what they don't realize is often the light nimitta in meditation is just a brightening of the whole visual landscape. And we miss the brightening our, of our lives because everything's just getting slowly brighter. And there's also oscillations up and down, but the general trajectory is up, even if we can't see it, because often we can't, only those around us can. So being good friends to ourselves. And finally, understanding that our own happiness, while important, it doesn't always work in terms of a language to sustain us, whereas duty does. So what duty do we have towards our friends, our Kalinamitta in the world? How do we be a true spiritual friend to all beings and honor the path by cl cleansing our hearts so we truly can be a selfless, uh, vet, you know, a selfless conduit of a gift to those in our lives? And, and how can we be a, a beautiful friend to all those we meet. And just highlighting that last word that Ajahn Nisbo used, beautiful, a beautiful fringe. How do we be a, a beautiful friend? Literally, Kalyana Mitta, Mitta is friend, Maitri, friendship, 
in Kalyan is literally beautiful. Uh, in the canon, you talk about there was a Janapada Kalyani, which is translated, Janapada is India, and Janapada Kalyani is like the beauty queen of India. So it's beauty on the outside, but here when we talk about beautiful friendship, it's beauty on the inside, and it, it's kind of amazing. Hopefully everyone has experienced this, but the longer you stay uh, in spiritual circles, genuine uh, practice circles, it seems you're surrounded more and more by beautiful people, and it's strange. You wonder, and I'm not, not talking about like supermodels necessarily, but um, it's strange. Is it the case that uh, I'm meeting more and more spiritually beautiful people, or is it just the case that I'm seeing beauty more clearly uh, with the same type of people? And I think it's, I think it's both. Um, but really, allowing this word beauty to come into your spiritual vocabulary uh, and just acknowledge that um, whatever the whatever the gender, whatever the any kind of external situation, there is a, a beauty, like a bright a brightness of heart that comes out and learning to see that and inclining the mind in that direction will make our own lives more beautiful. So hopefully everyone can, we can all practice these dawnings of the Dhamma and see the light um, more and more in our lives. Kataya Sadhu Karam Dadama Say Bonnie once asked why we sounded so morose when we said that. So it's supposed to be good and sober, but uh, we can add a little sparkle too. So <laughs> I think we have a time for questions and comments and discussion now. If you want to raise your electronic hand, if you're there in Zoom, uh, then you can do that. If you want to raise your real hand, if you're here, then we'll run a mic over to you. Do you think um, apadama uh, heedfulness could be as popular as mindfulness, and and why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. There's this line in the Dhammapada: apamad, apamato, amatopadam, pamato, yatop, apamado, apam. Yeah, basically, in English, uh, heedfulness is the path to the deathless. Uh, those who are heedful will not die. Those who are heedless are as if dead already. And oftentimes that's translated, uh, Ajahn Sumedho translates it as mindfulness is the path to the deathless. And I think that's true. Um, but yeah, it's not as catchy. It's not as, uh, and uh, I think heedfulness is just not a word that modern English users use on a regular basis. So other people have translated it as vigilance or um, yeah, alertness even. So we gotta have a, gotta work on that. Um, I don't know if you have a better translation or any thoughts on that? No, okay. We'll work on that. Uh, I've been encountering recently, uh, even in the morning, after having consumed some coffee, uh, a doldrum, a lethargy in the practice especially as I begin to calm. It's like the bottom falls out. And suddenly in the morning, which is usually a really strong time of meditation, I'm like falling into this, this nodding space. And in, if that happens in the afternoon, I know enough to get up and walk a bit. But in the morning, it just strikes me as very odd. So I'm not quite sure how to handle that yet. Drowsiness. Yeah, I think uh, a very common hindrance I think some skillful means is if you know of the sound of silence, the nada sound. So it's a, many of you know this, it's a subtle ringing below the auditory landscape that you can kind of tap into. If you haven't heard it before, then when the mind's a bit calm, then just try to listen for it. Or you can put in earplugs if that helps. And if you begin to pick it up, it 
can become more and more apparent until you can really keep it going through your whole, whole life, or at least during meditation when you turn your attention to it. And, and it's very brightening. Um, it can really help you stay awake. Ajahn, where his breath o o often can lead to drowsiness. So bringing in the sound of silence to supplement or even replace the breath during periods of drowsiness. Uh, I also think opening your eyes just a crack and meditating with like a, a soft but a soft focus with open eyes can be helpful. You can hold a stone or some object between your thumbs like that, and if it drops, you'll know you've slipped off. I know someone who uh, put a rock on his head and tied it to his ear somehow, but he kept it kept falling off and annoying the monk behind him, so he got admonished. You could do that. Um, and, you know, cold showers, exercise, brightening the mind before you sit. I also find that sometimes um, a micro nap can actually be very helpful is if you just can't get past things any other way, um, set the alarm for like three minutes and just quickly lie down until it goes off and then pop back up. And sometimes that brief dip down kind of can springboard you into calm, I find. The Buddha recommends pulling your ears as well. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question has to do with, as you go through this list, I noticed my body getting tenser and tenser and tenser. It's like, how am I ever going to do this? And I wondered if you could say something about sort of the Western mind and and... Um, meta for oneself, or, or there's got to be a balance, <laughs> and I'm, I just wasn't hearing that right now, and, and I understand this is for New Year's resolution, <laughs> but I'm wondering if you could share something that would kind of go, ah. <laughs> yeah, it's worth noting that this seems like a list, and we conveyed it like a list, but it's actually seven different suttas that are exactly the same except for one word and they're one after the other. So really I think that suggests that the Buddha would maybe have given these different initial starting places, these dawns, to different people who they were uniquely suited for. And we're just, you know, we're uh, talking to a lot of people who have different conditions and it is fascinating when you come to practice circles that some people are really enthusiastic and need more enthusiasm and something like uh, accomplishment in this wholesome desire. Chanda Sampada is really what they need. But maybe for other people, this Yoniso Manasikara Sampada, accomplishment in this coming back to the Yoni or appropriate attention, coming back and looking for the causes of things like um, Utejaniya, this looking at the mind, looking at the mind and coming back to that. I really think that that's a very legitimate way to practice yoniso manasikara. So just taking that and letting the other ones be just part of the, the dawn rise along with that. I think that's a really important point. And this flavor can come across in a lot of the teachings, like you said, the sort of disciplinarian or fire and brimstone or just more stuff to do and I'm already falling short and I think first it's worth noting that in this list, the Buddha begins with Kalyanamitta, spiritual friendship. And what a simple, beautiful thing to begin with. Just hang around good people and be a good friend to yourself. And, and that is a grounding, like when you notice yourself admonishing yourself, um, really noticing that, or when the Buddha's become in your mind someone who's not a good friend, who's you foolish man, you know, you foolish woman, whatever you know that something's gone off and just really noticing that this isn't the fault of the path. We come fully loaded for complete self-flagellation and we will be doing it to ourselves and ripping the skin off our backs our whole lives. And it's no surprise that of course those patterns come right into the path with us. And it's not the fault of the path. This is old karma. All the patterns, all the inputs, in this environment are wholesome. So when we have those patterns, just saying like, okay, this is old karma coming to fruition. I'm not gonna feed into it. And 
like you said, sometimes really emphasizing the parts of the path that counterbalance that and just people are doing, you're doing fine. If you're coming here on a Saturday morning, being with good people, if you're meditating 20 minutes a day, even, even less, but I think most of you can get 20 minutes. Um, that's an amazing standard, so rare. And just noticing when you veer into any sort of self aversion, um, that's not right. And really bringing to bear this metta. So thank you for emphasizing that. And yeah, I mean, there's no single phrase we can give that will alleviate that problem for more than a few minutes for people. Like, it's so deeply rooted, but keep an eye on it, absolutely. Did that address the issue a bit? Yeah. Maybe just uh, one more question. We have some announcements and, and things. Is that Mary with the hand up? Hello, Ajans. Hello, friends. Hello. I just wanted to um, kind of comment uh, as a comment more than a question on where do our eyes look? And over these holidays, I had a chance to visit my spiritual mother, Sister Florence and Rita, who are who were the two nuns who um, hosted us for many, many retreats. And Sister Florence now is 97 or something. She's very weak. She's in the nursing home. I went to see her. She recognized me. And her first question, apropos of where do our eyes look, her first question to me was, what is in your prayers? That's right where she went right what she wanted to talk, right to the heart of how is your practice. And I just find her a beautiful Kalyanamita. And also at 97, looking to the heart as the first question, a great, great lesson. And I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Mary. Florence and Rita were the two nuns who hosted our first retreats in Spokane. So. That's so good to hear about her. <laughs>